it's almost always a buy going back to the 1980s, meaning silver and silver equities. And this is a trade uh, secret, if you will, that I've used throughout my entire career and made money literally every time but once, is that when silver, gold's over issue. John Fedick, what's going on? Hey, Andy, how are you today? Doing good. It's really good to see you. You're on an, on a timely moment. Uh, we've had a pretty good bounce here the last week or so in the overall market. Let me know what your thoughts are on that. And uh, uh, we have a, a big uh, CPI number coming out tomorrow. Right. So CPI was deemed to be pretty benign on the last month's read. Um, and we're probably going to see more of that same thing tomorrow, which would be good for the overall broad market as well as for the gold and silver market, of course. Um, I think the action we saw last week, however, with Japan down 12.5% in one day um, and Bitcoin down almost 15 in one day, these are huge, huge drawdowns. And as someone who's been doing this for a long time, usually you see stuff like that and sure, there's going to be a rebound trade in a hot market like this, but you have to respect the charts. The charts are damaged now, right? Some would argue some of them are broken, depending as you look through the complex, whether it's technology or international stocks, where there's certain areas of the world that look very suspect and wobbly. Um, and that's, you know, we, 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 we basically are looking at you know, the, the world and saying this is becoming more and more of an unsafe place to invest for multiple reasons uh, that we've already talked about on your show before with the U.S. situation, right? Um, that's getting more interesting now, too, since we last talked because Kamala is the new uh, Democratic rep and she's gained a lot on Trump, according to the polls. We'll see. Um, but September 10th will be an important day now, right, with with them both agreeing to that debate. Um, September 18th for me is the most important day of the fall so far. That's going to be when the Fed talks about their, their um, 50 basis point cut or 25 basis point cut. I don't think it's uh, going to be anything but a cut, but that 25 or 50 will be number one important. Number two would be important if they do 50, you know, which is what the market's anticipating, a 54% probability. Um, then what is Powell saying after that, right? In terms of the direction of future cuts, that's, what's going to really be important, uh, because you can see from this price action, Andy, it's clearly like the market is factoring in this 50 basis point cut. That's the only reason it's as high as it is. Well, what's interesting to me is the broad market sold off significantly as it should have, if you would, with everything going on, but gold has been, and Silver sold off as well, but gold's been very, very firm here. Um, what do you, what's your opinion on that? Well, don't forget, silver's got about a 55 to 60% industrial component to it. I don't know if I actually buy that, but let's just say that's what, you know, most people are, are seeing um, or thinking about uh, when they think about silver is, let's say, roughly half industrial. And so when you have a sell-off in industrials, uh, where the broad market silver sometimes tanks initially, but then regains ground. And that's sort of what's happened here is that we've been on your show and other shows saying this 25 to 26 resistance level that existed all of last year got blown through this year to the upside, which is extremely bullish price action. Silver went all the way into the 32 to 33 range and backed off. So 33 is your new, you know, resistance level, but now 26 to me is like support, right? Like every time we start sniffing 25 to 26, or even call it 26, silver will rebound and find a trade. And that's really important. Another thing I'll point out about silver is the gold to silver ratio. I looked yesterday, it was around 87. And all that is, is price of gold divided by the price of silver per ounce, mm -hmm. right? Very simple to calculate. When you get to 90, it's almost always a buy going back to the 1980s, meaning silver and silver equities. And this is a trade uh, secret, if you will, that I've used throughout my entire career and made money literally every time but once, is that when silver, gold silver issue gets to 90, I start just buying undervalued silver miners. I bought Silver X today. It's treating like it's going out of business at 14 and a half cents. I mean, the chart looks really, really bad, but support is right here 
at 13 to 14. So I'm happy to buy it a little ahead of that because I think it would bounce off of that level. And so I'm not getting cute, in other words, with my entry, my order entry, where I'm like hoping for the best fill I could ever get because those days are probably gone. You have to pay a little bit more now uh, than in previous uh, time periods because um, we're in a better market for gold and silver, let's face it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that and work that out. Is I, I'm thinking I have a thesis here that the gold stocks and uh, the silver stocks, the metal stocks are actually positioning themselves exceptionally well. And I could be called wrong, but for a great uh, second part of the year here, um, what are your thoughts on that, specifically the equities and what I just said, as well as are you looking at anything new? Because you're always looking at great new value. That's why I have sure. you on. Yeah. What, what are you looking at? Well, we have a big position in GDX, which is the largest ETF out there run by Van Eck, right? That, that includes Newmont, Barrick, Agnico, all the big stuff, some of the mid, mid-tier stuff. But look at just like since we last recorded and what happened with earnings. Agnico, great quarter. Newmont, decent quarter. Barrick yesterday, amazing quarter. So like that's 31% of GDX right there. And so that's why GDX isn't fading. And we've been one of the only mining, you know, analysts out there that has been like saying, hey, 30 is like the floor. Like it's not going back to 22 to 26. So like that test that September of 22 too low. It's just not happening unless you get a black swan event, which I can't predict, right? Like right. things things tend to sell off. And as you saw with COVID in February and March of 2020, GDX broke 20 bucks very quickly because it's, you know, sell everything kind of moment, right? But but in a normalized market where I think gold is now to your point holding that 2300 level like a chip, like we're not going to see GDX tank um, because it encompasses most of the producing gold companies where these companies are showing great free cash flow and decent earnings. So I think the, the, the low is in for GDX. And it, for those of you that don't believe me, just pull up a five-year chart. You can then see what happened with 2020 low and the September 22 low, the lows are both in. You made a higher low along the way, right? So that's encouraging. So yeah, my thinking is we're we're going to set up for a nice run. To your point, there's still going to be a lot of things to look at. There always are. Um, September 18th, we pointed out, you know, is, is an important day. Um, I'd say BRICS, uh, October 22nd through 24th, that's going to be important. You've got the U.S. election in November, obviously, that's important. And then the big ones along the way, like CPI and other front payrolls, GDP, you have to pay attention to these numbers because the Fed has said they're data dependent, right? So they have to keep looking at these numbers and get a sense for where, you know, future cuts could lie. Um, I feel that uh, uh, to answer your question, we're looking for value in all different areas of the commodity world. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm posting my first commodities conference in October in Florida, and it's a broad commodities conference, oil, nickel, copper. It's not just gold and silver. Um, so in the nickel space, you know, premium nickel came out with really important news August 8th. Um, that ticker's PNRLF. And I've spent some time with Keith. You know, we've had like hour long meetings at least three times this year. I mean, super sharp guy. I would argue to anyone out there, go find me another Nicole junior who's raised as much money as they have in the last you know, two calendar years. These guys are raising a lot of money, which indicates to me that big money sees the potential for this mine to be rebuilt. And that's what that PR was saying August 8th, was that, you know, Salibi is growing much bigger than I think the market is expecting. And they're expected to have another report come out by the end of the second half of next year, which would be June, right? Uh, which would be a much more detailed report. Once that report is out, I think companies will start looking at this as a buy candidate, you know, um, because they're trading at 58 cents or 59 cents US right now. I mean, they didn't really get any love out of the report last week, yet it was a really strong report if you can read through the tea leaves to see that, you know, this company wants to sell the project eventually. And I think you just need to check the boxes along the way sometimes to get to that point. So I think very highly of, of that name during Botswana, which is the number one jurisdiction in Africa. Um, you know, what else? Um, as value managers, we look for weird stuff um, that happens through earnings, right? Like B2 Gold, BTG got smacked last week. They're holding in GDX and or J, depending on the quarter. Um, 
And, you know, Clive Johnson won co-CEO of the year a few years ago. I mean, they know what to do. They've got low costs, got a decent yield and you know, the stock's at 250. It's like at some point this thing just goes back to three. It's like an easy trade, if nothing else. But we hold it as a core holding. Um, we've been very disappointed with the news in January around Mali. Um, that's also in Africa. Um, but that, that situation is going to figure itself out next year. So, um, you don't have a, t a terribly long wait. I don't think, um, going through the, my mind and commodities, I think, um, yeah. So copper, copper came out with, uh, the, the inflection resources I just spoke with for the, f the second time last week, it's AUCUF in the, in the States, um, they're part of the new quest, uh, group and, and, you know, Alistair is a, a sharp CEO who has developed a really nice, you know, uh, joint venture with Anglo and Anglo is basically paying all of their costs. So, you know, uh, not all of their costs, I mean, you can't, you know, operate a company for free. Um, but like in terms of drilling, that's the main cost of any junior, correct? I mean, like you, it's a very capital intensive business. So if you go to the, the inflection resources website, you can see on their presentation, they spell it out really clearly. Like Anglo is going to be deciding which targets they're going to focus more on this fall. So I, again, it's just, it's like, they're going to have regular news flow paid by a major, um, in, in a hot gold market. So it's, it's, it's more of a, a copper gold story really. Um, but I think very highly of copper too, as you know, I think like copper pulled a very poor year last year. A really nice first start, you know, it's in the first few months of this year and now faded back again. That's when you question to yourself, like, okay, I missed that little move earlier this year. Now it's like approaching prices that we saw last year. Why wouldn't I buy copper here or a copper stock like inflection, right? That's just beaten up. Um, yeah. so that's, that's what we do as value managers. We look for those opportunities where we may have missed something earlier and now we're taking advantage of it. If I could um, ask I'll ask you a little bit about copper, not to interrupt you, but um, yeah, so copper has sold off. It had such a tear the first part of the year and then fears of recession and we still, or we might be in one or but whatever. Um, and coffers really come back to earth. What are your thoughts here moving forward? Do you like it? Uh, just copper in general here, or do you think yeah. we're uh, significantly going to sell off more? So last July, Goldman Sachs said a year and a half from then, which would be the end of 2025, that they expected, um, sorry, two and a half years from then, they expected that um, copper would be around 15,000 to 18,000 a metric ton, which is way higher than current prices. Um, and so I went out hardcore last August, September, October, and spoke at like five different conferences. And part of my presentation was always copper to say, when Goldman and then Morgan Stanley and some of these big shops get behind our sector, it's, it's important to note because they typically don't go out on a limb, you know, when you yeah. go out on a limb on tech or healthcare or something, but they're not going to go out on a limb on copper or gold a lot of times. And so that's kind of important to know, you know, and, and uh, so I, I, I mean, look, big money's behind copper's move. I don't think it's a hundred percent predicated on China's success at this point. Um, Sure. If China invades Taiwan or something crazy happens, then, you know, you have to, you're going to get a knee jerk reaction down in copper for sure. Uh, yeah. but I think like that would just be a buying opportunity because the electrification of the world is now such that like copper is, is it, it's known to be a, ne a needed commodity and it's in, um, short supply and yeah. you don't, you know, you don't restart copper mines, like flipping a switch, right? It takes a long, long time to get stuff started again. And that, that goes for everything, gold, silver, nickel, you, you know, that's, I think the biggest mistake or I don't know if I want to call it a mistake, but I think the biggest misunderstanding from the investing public is how long it takes to restart a mine. Uh, like we're talking about with premium nickel, like they, they, they put years of work in to get to this MRE that they just put out on the stage, right? It's like, it doesn't just happen. It takes so much work. Um, and that doesn't mean you're successful. It means you're getting to, you know, play ball. Right. But a guy like Keith will get it done. I, I feel very confident, you know? Um, and, and so one of our screens is management, right? Like you look at management and say, can you, 
figure out a path within your little subsector of the world to get to a higher price and make me money as an investor. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking with uh, Farhad, who's CEO of Millennial Potash, uh, MLPNF. Again, challenging myself. I'm not a Potash investor by trade, but I have traded larger names in the past and I've almost always made money in agriculture. So, you know, this is a little small stock that's under pressure right now. The chart doesn't look wonderful, but as a value manager, you buy stuff like this. When you start looking at the dynamics for potash and understanding that like the Israeli conflict is putting pressure on prices, like there's so many things going on in the commodities world in general that could drive some of these stocks higher, uh, because they're trading, you know, I looked at it right before we recorded, it's got an RSI of 39. Anytime you get an RSI of 30 or lower, these things are generally oversold. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the screens that we use, um, technically, you know, where management would be a fundamental screen, RSI is a technical screen. Well, I kind of like that you brought up or that you married the fundamentals, you're a value person at heart, if you would, but use the technicals for entry and exit. And I, yep. I, I, you actually surprised me because I didn't expect you to bring up a potash or potash. Uh, that's something I've been very interested in actually for a year now. And what was the company name again? Yeah, Millennial Potash, MLPNF. Okay. I asked them to send me some dynamics on like the potash market because I always like to see, you know, if a company can readily do that, like an e email me within like 30 minutes, you know, here's, here's the backdrop for where we operate and not just the potash market in general. So, um, it was a pretty compelling, you know, uh, argument for why to buy the stock here. And that's one we're, we're retracting right now. Yeah. And just so all of our listeners know, I, first time I heard of the stock from you or anybody else. And uh, I am not a current investor in pot potash, um, but what I do like about it, and like is the wrong word, but what's made, what's interesting is that a lot of pot potash is um, um, from Eastern Europe, if you would, specifically Ukraine. Again, hot zone, trouble zone, and you need that. It's used in fertilizer, and you need that if you would do uh, for, the agriculture needs that to feed the world. So, Absolutely. I think it's I think it's a very uh, it's an interesting play to, in that commodity. Talk to me a little bit more, more about uh, the precious metal stocks. Do you have anything else that was looking interesting for you? And uh, yeah. Well, you, you mentioned copper. And so you could play it through a mining stock like Inflection. You could play it through a Freeport MacMoran on the big side. You could yeah. also play it through a royalty company. So, you know, royalty companies are interesting because they're looking for value. The best ones look for value in any commodity, right? Um, Ecora Resources, um, ECRAF, is uh, based out of London. Uh, again, as a value manager, it just called my attention around 95 cents. I wrote it up on my newsletter at 95 cents. It's trading lower than that now. In full disclosure, it's trading at like 81 cents. Um, but I just thought, hey, you know, this thing is like in a free fall. It's a royalty company, people. It's like, it's, it's not going out of business. Like, I mean, they have a very diverse portfolio. If you go to Ecora Resources website, you can see that they're involved in a, love, a number of different projects that are in production now, and they have a huge pipeline, which is what, you know, gets me excited with any royalty company. It's not just what's producing right now, but what do you have in the pipe? And they have ways to replace revenue, which I think is what the market's missing, right? They're waiting to see, you know, how much um, revenue they'll lose from um, producing assets, right? Which is a fair, um, you know, uh, observation, but if you actually talk to Mark at the company, they have quite a good game plan in place to replace that revenue and grow revenue. So to me, I mentioned Vox Royalty, I think on your program before under two bucks, that's trading at 275 now. Same thing with Vox. They, they, they told the market, hey, we're going to have a light news year because we're going to, where our pipeline is generally 20, 2025, 2026, right? And the stock's taken, I mean, for a royalty company to go from 190 to 275, that's pretty exciting. So that's how I see a core, you know, at 81 cents, a lot of the risk is out. Um, I think, you know, if you go to a dollar very easily, um, it just trades wonky in the U.S. because it's a London-based equity. Yeah. So let me ask you here is, and I love royalty companies. I own royal, royalty companies. I don't own the royalty companies that you mentioned. But I love the business model, but I'm trying to, I'm scratching my head on this. I asked Rick Rule the same question. What's the downside of owning a royalty company? I, I think in this market, the easy answer is you can buy an exploration company like 
inflection at 11 cents and it goes to 22 by accident in a hot hopper market, right? Like you can double your money in some of these names. And I, I rarely say that. I, I, I never talk one bagger, three bagger, five bagger on shows, but in this case, like there are some juniors out there that I track our own that to me, you know, let, let's look at Mexico for an example, right? You could see, um, I just interviewed the Sonoro gold, uh, CEO for the first time, I don't know, about like three or four weeks ago, they're trading at two cents us. I mean, for them to go to four us would not be a stretch at all on good Mexican news in the fall, right? We need to hear from Scheinbaum president to see what's happening with her cabinet, with what her direction is going to be. That's going to determine the permitting path for a company like Sonoro, right? But if you look at a two-year chart, I mean, the stock did a lot of volume at six, seven, eight cents. So at two cents, like it, it, see it go to three or four, it's staying there for a while. It's it's not out of the question. Um, and so that's the kind of stuff I'm, I'm interested in because John and Ken have been doing it 25 years. They, they're not like the type of investors or, or executives that are inflammatory. They're just like, look, we we're, we're biding our time right now. We realize it's a difficult time, uh, for Mexico in general, uh, but we're prepared. Right. So when we get the green light, we're ready to go. And that's a near return production story. Yeah. So let's see, give me your, some parting thoughts and any, anything else that you're looking at before we end here. Well, I'm looking at anything gold that looks ridiculously valued versus where they were 10 to 15 years ago. So I'm looking at longer term charts, Andy, to look at, okay, what did this gold stock do in 2011, 12 and 13 when gold was cranking back then? Because the gold price is much, much higher. That's what a lot of investors that are in this sector don't even understand is that like, just look at a 20 year chart of gold and then draw like GDX or GDXJ as, you know, representation for the sector on top of that. And you can see. Gold stocks have not participated with the rise in gold, which is extremely frustrating to me, you, and a lot of your listeners. But, you know, let's, let's examine why. Costs have gone up. Inflation has been putting pressure on margins. Like, there's so many things to list. Uh, jurisdictional risk has gone up immensely. There's, there's a lot of reasons why. Um, but when you look at something, I just interviewed uh, Sean Heinrichs from uh, 1911 Gold for the first time, AUMBS. And I asked Sean, what's your market cap? He said 17 million Canadian. And then Don Durrett, who partners with me on some things, who's been on your show, I believe. Um, Don asked, or didn't you have like close to a billion dollar market cap in 2012 or 13? And Sean said, yeah, I did. So, so we're not saying the stock goes from 17 Canadian to a billion Canadian. We're saying that if it goes from 17 million Canadian to 34 million Canadian, you just made a hundred percent on your investment. Like that's. The reality of what this market is right now is that when gold breaks 2,500, as you've seen, that like big round number in the sand has been problematic. When that breaks to the upside, I don't know where gold goes. It's going higher. And yeah. 2,600, 2,700, 2,800, people will start Google searching cheap gold stocks like 1911 gold, in my opinion, and just say, look, I mean, this is worth a flyer here because it's, it's, it's in a good jurisdiction and they have, you know, a history of uh, uh, at the company where a lot of these mining companies, Andy, they don't have a history at all, right? The the biggest thing that I hear from execs that have been doing this 25, 30 years that I respect is like, if you have a past producer, you know, maybe build a project right near there or buy, you know, some land like, uh, connected to that, that area. So like you have a higher chance of taking out down the road. Um, I've seen this over and over again. And, and so like, we don't try to reinvent the wheel where we're, we're putting money into a, a, a junior gold or silver company. That's literally a year old, right? Where they have very little prospects in the middle of nowhere. Um, like we, we try to focus on good jurisdictions with good management and, and increase our chances for success. Okay. Got it. Tell me, uh. How do people get in touch with you and tell me about your conference coming up that I will be at? Sure. Yeah. We're pleased to have you. Our company is one of the three media companies that are going to be attending. Uh, we'll have Kitco as one of the others. And yeah, it's going to be October 20th to the 22nd in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida at the beautiful Four Seasons. Um, it's the only five diamond uh, resort in the metro area. It's been open two years. So we're getting a lot of great feedback from investors and company CEOs. 
that want to just, you know, go to Florida, have a great time, but also mix in some business. And so I think we're going to generate a lot of interest. Um, you know, one of the guys I respect, Rick Rule, does his conference as you, you attended back in uh, just a few weeks ago, the Rural Symposium down in Boca. And Boca is about a 25 minute ride from our conference. So we're hoping to reach out two investors that attended that three, you know, show like yours and the other ones I'm on is, Hey, come on by our show. I think we're going to put up some really interesting companies, a couple of which I mentioned today that are going to be attending, uh, that are very, very deep value situations. Uh, and why would we do that? Well, I don't want to have the investors have a bad experience, right? Like this is a tough sector. So if you buy something cheap at my conference in October and you go and look at the, the, um, financial statement six or 12 months down the road, hopefully you've made some money and you'll come back to our conference next year. Right. And so, um, we're going to, we're going to host about 35 companies and a lot of great investors there and put on a really you know, high class event. Excellent. Well, I will link, uh, to that website as well as to your corporate site. If people want to reach out to you and if they're interested in attending. I will also be there. I'm sure I'll, I will interview you before then, but I will also be there. So to all the listeners, please say hi to John or myself uh, when you do see me. I had a great feedback at the Real Symposium and and a lot of people just said hello. Hey, I know you. So it's kind of neat. <laughs> uh, John, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. I will link to everything and put all the tickers for our, uh, uh, and link to the companies in the show notes uh, below this uh, show. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Andy. Thank you.